from family events to volunteer opportunities to community happenings, there is a lot going on in your community. Learn about all the possibilities and opportunities on this episode of Community Hotline. here with Com uh, Community Hotline, uh, sitting in for Monica Weitzel, who is out pretending to be sick. Um, today, we're going to talk with Catholic Charities of Oregon about the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals Program. Uh, this is new from Obama, and uh, the Catholic Charities Organization is, has decided to participate in helping people navigate this, this new uh, law. And we have with us from Catholic Charities of Oregon, Sarah McLean. Welcome. Thank you. Um, first, to get started, why don't you just tell us a little bit about the Catholic Charities Organization, a little background information. Sure. Yeah, thanks for having me here today. Mm -hmm. uh, so Catholic Charities is a social service agency that works on behalf of the Catholic Church in the Archdiocese of Portland, um, has been present in the, in the state of Oregon, and we work throughout Oregon in various programs um, for over 100 years. Uh, the Immigration Legal Services program has been around since 1996. Okay. Um, other programs in you know, the Catholic Charities Agency as a whole include uh, services for survivors of domestic violence, uh, services for homeless women, mm -hmm. the pregnancy and adoption program, and several others. And then of course, I'm here on behalf of the Immigration Legal Services program where we provide um, immigration legal services, consultations, and representation to low-income immigrants. Okay, great. So lots, mm -hmm. lots going on. Lots going on. So we're just focused today on the the DACA, which you're calling DACA? DACA, yes. All right, no one's calling it DACA. You could call that if you okay. want. I go, I go with DACA. All right, well, I'm from the Midwest. So I'm going to say DACA. Okay. Um, so why don't you just explain a little bit about what this exactly means? What like What's the elevator speech about? What would you tell somebody, I guess? Sure. So on June 15, 2012, the Obama, Obama administration mm -hmm. announced a new program, a new process uh, for young people who arrived in the United States as children who are undocumented, where they can uh, request with, um, a deferral of action in an immigration case and receive work authorization for a, a granted uh, deferral of this uh, what's called deferred action. Mm -hmm. um, so it's important to know that this is an administrative action. It's not a law. So it is a temporary program, and it's discretionary, granted on a case-by-case -case basis. Okay. So that announcement was made on June 15th, and then on August 15th of 2012, uh, the Agency under Homeland Security of U.S. Uh, Citizenship and Immigration Services began accepting requests for uh, Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, or DACA. And uh, cases that are granted receive uh, a deferral period of two years and the work permit for two years that is renewable. Okay, and so why was this introduced exactly? Well, the uh, Department of Homeland Security has uh, taken many steps to exercise prosecutorial discretion in order to focus their resources and our immigration laws on the cases that, that need the most attention. Also in doing so, they recognize this group of young, productive people who are undocumented and very limited in the participation they were able to take in their communities. Um, although this is not a law and it doesn't provide them with a path to permanency or citizenship, this is a step to where someone is able to more fully participate in, in the community and, and in their lives that, that didn't exist before. Okay, and so it's a, it's a two year period basically to work within the system and see how it goes and hope for the best or? That's a, a great question. Well, deferred action is um, a deferral of, of any action on the case unless <coughs> terminated for other reasons. And at this time, the way the DACA program exists, people will be able to renew their requests at the near the end of the two years. Okay. And of course, you know, um, all of us at Catholic Charities and others are hoping that this is something that is useful while we await um, 
perhaps a law that will help people on a path to permanency. Okay, so if someone was interested in, in applying for this, what would be the first thing they should do? Um, well, a, a great resource for information is actually the U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services website, this USCIS.gov. Because this is a new program, a new process, mm -hmm. they have the most up-to-date and thorough information. They actually just updated um, their frequently asked questions last week. So that would be a great place to start. Also, contact uh, Catholic Charities or another um, accredited nonprofit agency if someone is interested in scheduling a consultation to find out more about their individual case. Um, we'll talk about the requirements, but it's just important to note that even though the requirements are somewhat straightforward, every individual's facts are very unique and it, it merits an individual consultation with um, someone who ha has experience, an, an experienced immigration attorney or nonprofit agency. Okay, so, so following that, what kind of evidence would someone need to come up with in order to state their case? Sure. Well, the eligibility requirements are that the person must, uh, they must be 15 years old in order to apply to okay. submit a request. Uh, they have to have been under 31 uh, years of age as of the date of the announcement, again, June 15th, 2012. They have to uh, have arrived in the United States before the age of 16. They have to have been uh, residing continuously in the United States since June 15, 2007 to the present. They also have to show that they were physically present in the, in the U.S. on the date of the announcement. Um, they have to have been undocumented mm -hmm. or um, a status that, that have, was expired at, on that same date of the announcement. Um, they have to show that they are currently in school, enrolled in school, um, ab have obtained graduated uh, with a diploma, obtained a GED, um, or honorably discharged from military services. And finally, there are uh, good moral character related requirements where someone cannot have uh, been convicted of a felony mm -hmm. or a significant misdemeanor or three misdemeanors and may not otherwise pose a threat to national security or public safety. That all sounds like a very complicated math problem to me. Yes, it is a bit of a logic <coughs> puzzle. Now, um, uh, and you said if somebody was here under uh, another program and it had to have expired, prior to the date, so another kind of a work visa or some oh, other some... For example, if someone had, had arrived as a child on a, a visitor visa many years ago and it had, they had since overstayed, they would um, qualify for the program, but they okay. had to be out of, that, out of that status as of the date of the announcement. Okay. And so you'd gather all this information and, you know, people are nervous about this, about divulging all this information yeah. about themselves. So. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. So uh, it is, you know, an application <clears throat> or a request for uh, DACA involves the specific forms from uh, USCIS and the filing fee, which is four hundred and sixty-five dollars, and then also document documentation of each of those elements, which can be very straightforward in some cases and can be really complicated in others. For example, if it's a student who's currently in school and they need to show their past, the past five years they were present, a school transcript may complete most of that. Mm -hmm. Or if it's someone who's been out of school for many years uh, because they're undocumented, they've been very limited on the type of, of work or activities they've been able to participate in, so there, it's going to be a little bit more of a creative document gathering process for other cases. Mm -hmm. um, so each case will have the, the forms, the fees, and the supporting proof and uh, filed with USCIS and uh, involves also a, uh, a background check for every applicant. Okay, and so you said 400 and how? And 465 dollars. Which that, could be quite difficult for a lot of people. Yes, yeah. So um, there is a possibility of requesting a fee exemption, mm -hmm. but the requirements for that are very specific. And anyone who's interested in that, I would encourage them to visit the USCIS website or, again, get a consultation with, with Catholic Charities or another agency. Okay. And do we have any kind of an idea about the number of people in the United States that this sort of window yeah. allows? Uh, the Immigration Policy Center uh, 
provided a, a very helpful report where they estimated over, over 2 million people that were potentially eligible or could be eligible in the future uh, for the program. And of that number in Oregon, it was, it's estimated that 22,000 people are eligible or could be eligible for DACA. Wow. And that's just the people that fall within that narrow parameter yeah. of mm -hmm. the 15 to 30 at a certain date and time and all that. Um, and so all the other people older or younger are not allowed to participate. Uh, to submit a request, a person must meet all of the eligibility requirements. But for example, uh, say someone's 14 right now and they, they turn 15 in December, at that time they would be eligible to oh, apply. Okay, I see. So all right, so it it's not so much, a, it's not a window of time, it's, it's, a, it's that person's personal window. Right, Okay. but right. they did have to be under 31 <clears throat> as of the date of the announcement. Okay, good, because I misunderstood that. It seemed like we were just opening the door for five minutes and then shutting it and... Yeah. Okay, so each person has their own Correct. opportunity. Or a, another example would be for uh, if someone uh, was not currently enrolled in school at the time of the announcement, mm -hmm. and then they did register for school, then they would qualify. Okay, okay. And since you guys started doing this, the Catholic Charities Organization, how, about how many cases have you dealt with? Uh, well, we've, we've uh, met with a lot of people. We've done the frequent um, community outreach uh, education mm -hmm. events to over 2,000 people. We have uh, provided initial consultations, uh, screenings for about 400 people and assisted uh, around 200 people with their application process, either individual representation on cases or in a, a workshop format mm -hmm. setting. Um, I'd like to note that at, at our office at Catholic Charities, we, um, we feel it's really important that each person who we work with has a complete screening for any form of immigration benefit, any type of case, so that the, each individual is aware if they have any other possibilities. As I mentioned before, DACA is not a path to permanency, so we want people to know whether they might have some other eligibility that they meet under immigration law that might lead them to permanency in the future, or if not, that will help them make the best decision in their own case whether to, to apply or not. And we've actually uh, found that as many as 20% of people that we've met with could be potentially eligible for something else. Okay. And so when people are coming in, what is the most common aspect of the, the evidence gathering that is that has been troubling or has basically knocked a person out of the running? As for the documentation? Yeah. Um, well, the more common pieces of evidence mm -hmm. that we see are school transcripts, uh, bank statements or bank records, uh, lease agreements, uh, you know, or rental agreements, utility bills, um, medical records, if I didn't mention that already, or immunization records mm -hmm. um, are, also, are pretty common. It might also be um, letters of support. So, uh, for example, from a church or another activity or group someone's in, or the person's own declaration. It can be difficult, as I mentioned before, for uh, the applicants who have been out of school for a while and have been very limited since they're undocumented and if they can work or not to, to have that fairly, you know, complete uh, history and, in, in, um, you know, in proof, paper format. Right. So um, if someone doesn't have a complete history, though, they're still eligible to apply, and it's just un in, the, in the review process, they would sort of have to suss that out. Right. Okay. USCIS uh, <clears throat> may request additional evidence during the process, and they may even request a, an interview with the applicant if needed. That's not common, but it, they could. And is this going to take years and years and years to sort out? I mean, with all the people that could potentially apply. Uh, right now, the cases are, are taking around three to six months, I think, is a, a, a pretty good estimate of how long between uh, submitting the request and receiving a decision. Mm -hmm. And then from the at, the at the decision date, if they, are, if they receive deferred action mm -hmm. status, they can move ahead. It's the, uh, the two-year period mm -hmm. and then renewable as they... Uh, um, get closer to that end of the two years. Okay. Now, is there any sort of last advice you'd like to give for somebody who is considering applying for this? Yeah, I. Uh, this is something that we're really excited about for people. It's been a, a true pleasure to work with DACA applicants, a, a group of 
of um, great young people. At the same time, I would uh, recommend to anyone who thinks they might be eligible or interested in the program to s seek you know, reputable advice, uh, legal counseling with an experienced immigration attorney or again a, an accredited nonprofit agency like Catholic Charities or another nonprofit in the area uh, to, to get uh, good advice to, for that person to know whether they are a good candidate or not. Um, this is immigration and you know we want people to be able to take advantage of this, this great benefit but at the same time be well aware of any potential risks because every case can be so different and every case is decided on a case-by-case -case basis. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else at all you'd like to add about this? Maybe what brought you to it personally, or um, I don't know, anything that we've overlooked, I guess? Um, I appreciate being here, and I, I okay. hope that anyone uh, who's you know, interested finds out more information and um, you know, is supportive of friends or family who might be in this, in this process, because uh, it's, it's really important for um, our communities and our nation to have you know young people who have grown up their whole lives here considering themselves to be Americans to to be able to fully well more fully participate in their communities so okay yeah. great well, thank you so much yeah thanks for having me I want to thank Sarah McLean from Catholic Charities of Oregon for coming in today and talking to us a little about a little bit about their program to help people with the deferred action for childhood arrivals status bill what do you want to call it? It's, it's a program. It's yeah, a program. it's not a bill. <laughs> All right, thanks. Yeah. Thanks for tuning in to Community Access.